Good day, everyone. God is good. All the time. Well, I want to put it on record that I thank Father Taylor personally for giving me the opportunity in ministry to meet my dear wife, Debbie. Uh, the, day, the day of my engagement, Father came to support me. I don't know if you remember that, Father. Because Debbie's father was not too happy with me because I was the leader of a commune. That's what he thought. That Debbie was going to live on a farm with chickens and cows and goats because I belong to a commune and I'm a leader of a commune like Jim Jones. But thank God, we are, we are people who are called to live in community. Amen? And... Uh, some people came to discourage um, Debbie from getting married to me because of my because of <laughs> my commune status. But I want to let I want to let you know that this year we'll be celebrating 30 years married. Yeah. Amen. I've I've had a lot of run-ins with Father Taylor. He's a, a, a someone I respect a whole lot. And I love a whole lot. And I thank God for this opportunity to support the ministry of Jesus' explosion today. Amen. Amen. Now I notice this is not a real amen fire crowd. But I like to work with fire people. Because there are two sets of Christians, actually three sets of Christians in the world. There are fire starters and fire extinguishers. But I like to work with fire starters. They are all, there's also another group of Christians called asbestos Christians. They are fireproof. They don't want to be on fire. They are textbook Catholics. But after what I have been through in the last few months, I could never be a textbook Catholic anymore. All the time. So, brothers and sisters, just this year, a few weeks ago, I couldn't lift my hands to put on the light switch in the washroom. I couldn't even bathe myself. Thank God for my dear wife. There are so many things that I couldn't do for myself. But when I walk into this room and I hear the praises of God and I can lift my hands, I lift them as high as I could lift them. I'm not going to hold back anything from the one who rescued me from death and brought me back to life. And it's the little things that make the big difference in our lives. So I want to beg you. Every time you hear me say amen, support me by saying hallelujah. Glory. Amen. 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 Yes. <laughs> We've come here today to Jesus' explosion. To bring fire in this place. Jesus says, I came to bring fire on the earth. And how I wish it were blazing already. Don't sit down on the fire. Fan the fire. As a matter of fact, everybody stand up. Stand up. We're going to bring down the glory of God in this place. So we're going to start from down here. And we will say glory. You got that? Go down. Glory. But this time you're going to hold it on for 10 seconds. Let's do it again. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's be seated in heavenly places. Okay, all right. On the 25th, of April this year, 
I had an experience that I'm going to stop calling an accident and I'm going to start calling it an encounter. Because God is not a kind of accident God. I'd like to thank all the people who prayed for me. There were multiple people all over this archdiocese, in pa all parishes, prayer groups, communities, families who were praying for me. And I want to thank you this morning. Because your prayers worked. Because there is power in prayer. And I want to tell you something. Catholic prayers, strong. Catholic prayers, powerful. Because we have the backing of heaven. Amen. Amen. That's what we're talking about. So 24 years ago, our community bought 10 acres of land to build a retreat center. Because it was always our intention to help people bring their faith to maturity. Because we are very good at bringing people into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. But we need to learn how to journey with people, spend time with people, and so on. So we wanted to create this space. If you go to certain retreat centers, you got to pay through your teeth. Right? So we wanted to have a space where ordinary people could be able to come and spend time with God and grow, get away from the rat race and grow. So we've had this, we've had this land there for a while and we've been doing very little because, you know, it's costly to, to do that kind of work and so on. But we've been going at it little by little by little. And I'm always going up the hill. I bought a 4x4 four four, uh, truck, a Hilux. Very, very reliable. Every time I see the truck, I put my hand in and say, Lord, thank you for this wonderful machine you gave to me. Even when it was mangled up in the wreck, I still said, Lord, thank you for this wonderful machine you gave to me. So this day, I'm going to carry workers on Praise Mountain. We call it Praise Mountain. And at the bottom of the hill on Praise Mountain, I hear this voice asking me a question. If this vehicle fails you, what are you going to do? If this vehicle fails you while you're going up the hill, what are you going to do? And in the silence of my soul, I said, well, I'm going to jam down on the brakes. And the voice said, and if the brakes fail, what are you going to do? I said, the brakes fail, I'm going to reverse into the embankment and stop the vehicle from moving. Not even 15 or 20 seconds after those two questions hit me, the very same thing happened. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that our God is an on-time God. Our God is aware of all that's going on in your life. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what has already happened. And he's always preparing us. He's always talking. He's always transmitting. To us. To tune into God's frequency. To listen to God. And avoid the kind of mess that could overtake our lives if we don't listen to God. So thank God, when this happened, I had something to do. Because I was just thinking about it. These thoughts were fresh in my mind. If, those, if, if, if I had not had that, those questions, I shudder to think what would have happened to me and the four passengers in the vehicle. Because this thing happened so fast. You, so immediately, I jammed down on the brakes. The brakes were... The brakes were depending on the engine. The brakes failed. So I immediately, I had something to work with. I turned into the embankment. And as I turned into the embankment, um, the vehicle just started tumbling. And I felt like I was in a washing machine or a dryer just being, you don't know where up is, where down is, where side is. It feels like you're there for an eternity. 
is one of the sickest feelings you could ever imagine. So we tumbled and tumbled and tumbled and the vehicle stopped. The last thing I remember was being dragged on my tummy, my stomach, torso. On the van is on top of me and it's dragging me. I usually show people my wounds, but Debbie is a bit sensitive about that. Mind, mindful? But I will show you anyway. <laughs> because wounds, brothers and sisters, for Christians, wounds are not things to remind us that we were defeated. Wounds remind us that we survived it. That we are, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. The devil appeared to St. Teresa of Avila in the form of Jesus. And she said to him, get behind me, Satan. And he laughed and he said, how did you recognize me? She says, you have no wounds. So don't be ashamed of your wounds. Don't be ashamed of your pain. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So this the last thing I remember was being dragged on my stomach. No, you're not going to get that. <laughs> That's the last thing I remembered. Now, fast forward. The next day, I was in hospital. And I felt that something was missing. That I'm missing part of this thing. So one of the brothers, let me tell you who were in the vehicle with me, the contractor for the work that we were doing, who is not Catholic, a Venezuelan, a Cuban, and one of our leaders. So we had the United Nations in, in the <laughs> in the van. But I felt something was missing, so I said to him, Kevin, can I talk to you a minute? What really happened on the mountain? And he said, brother, when the vehicle stopped, and we started to account for people, we couldn't account for you. And it's then we realized you were trapped with part of your body outside of the vehicle, and the vehicle on top of your back. He said, we tried our best to lift the vehicle so we could pull you out. And it was too heavy. He said, your tongue was on the road. Your two eyes were half open. And you were not breathing. He said, for at least eight minutes... You were unresponsive. Well, the Cuban ran into the forest looking for something to use as leverage to raise the vehicle. Because it was frustrating for them, especially for Kevin, who I'm very close to, my brother in the Lord. He had already started to think, oh my God. All Brother Winston's organs are smashed up because of the weight of that vehicle on my back. He says, all kind of things start going through my mind. But the Cuban came back now with a piece, of, a piece of wood that was infested with termites. So as they're coming and as he's walking, the, wood, the piece of wood, is, the pieces are falling off. So the, in their hearts, they're saying, but this thing can't do nothing. Six of us couldn't lift it up. This little piece of wood could do anything. But he put it underneath the vehicle, and they were able to prize it up. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, some of us who feel that our lives are useless, 
and it's not, does not add up to much. I want to tell you, when your life is in the hands of God, all things are possible. So, they prized it up, and they told Kevin, pull him out. And Kevin says, as he's pulling, as he's pulling me, and now, first of all, I'm a little heavier than Kevin. So, he was saying, but I can't, why are they asking me? Oh, anyway, he says my body was so light that he was able to re remove me easily from under the vehicle. What happened next? Kevin said a whole set of thoughts just rushed into his mind. He's saying, I am pulling out Brother Winston's corpse from under the vehicle. They had checked for signs of life, and they were not seeing any signs of life. My complexion, I had become extremely dark. I think that is, that is consistent with people who have been strangled or people who have been hung. I became absolutely dark. Kevin is saying, I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to tell Sister Debbie that I was the last person to see Brother Winston alive. How am I going to tell the community how he died? But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, when we least expect it, when we, we seem to have nothing, God is up to something. So, as Kevin pulled me out, all of a sudden, a rush of life just jolted me and shot me up from the ground straight up in the air. Suddenly, they couldn't believe it because for eight minutes I was unresponsive and they knew I was dead. Nobody could survive not breathing with a heavy load on top of your back. They thought it was eight minutes, but when they described all that they had to do, I think eight minutes was kind of generous. They had to go in the forest and look for wood. They tried to lift it up. They couldn't make it and all that. So I just shot up from the ground, and I, 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 I was about to start running. And they grabbed me, they said, you can't do that. You can't do that, brother. You can't do that, brother. And they said, oh my God, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Put me to lie down. They put me to lie down on the ground, on the road, and I wasn't getting any air. They said, put me to sit, sit up 90 degrees. Put me 90 degrees. Still not getting any air. I said, let's try 45. Because I'm the eternal optimist. I believe that God is with me, and I'll be okay. Things might be looking difficult. Things might be looking impossible, but God always finds a way. I said, put me 45, and they put me 45, and I was able to get some air. And then Kevin started making checkpoint, called ambulance, none available. Yes, none available at that time, but I'll tell you something. When God, when man can provide, God provides. All of a sudden, a man with a pickup, now it's a private, our, our road is a private road. It's not a thoroughfare. But the, the, the first peoples use our road to get to their place. And a man came for the first time in his life to do a delivery for the first people with a pickup. So he says, listen, I'm just going to offload all my stuff, and we're going to get him to the hospital. In the meantime, my nephew, who is a, a Coast Guardsman, they called him, and he came in a hurry. When he came, he says, where is my uncle? He says, look him on the ground right there. And he says, that is not my uncle. I was unrecognizable. You would not recognize me. 
He said, that's not my uncle. They said, yes, that is Uncle Winston right there. Anyway, so he ripped the seat off, the back seat of his car, and they put me on it, and they put me on the back of it. Now, before I moved out of there, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. As I came out and I started breathing, I was immediately surrounded by lights, blue and white heavenly lights all around me. Those lights were alive. They were comforting. They were ministering. They were lights of purpose. They were all around me, all around me, all around me, all around me. And I said to the brothers, I said, fellas, are you all seeing the lights? They say, what lights? They're not seeing anything, but these lights are all around me. And the way I can describe it, for those of you who do chemistry and so on and you work in labs, there is a flask with a round bottom that you, 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 can, uh, you can mix chemicals and so on for experiments, yes? But it has a long, um, it's called, a, well, I call it a beaker, but I was corrected by Her Majesty. <laughs> But it was like a beaker, all right? It's round at the bottom, and there's a long tube like that. The round, the wrong part of it was around me. And there was a tube heading out to the east. And it appeared as though I could have stayed or I could have gone. But the lights were the lights were there around me, and the lights were in front of me. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, at that moment, at that time, I knew I was in trouble. I never felt pain like that in my whole life. I couldn't breathe. My skin burning me like fire on me because all of this is missing and I can't breathe I I'm feeling the amount of pain I'm feeling it's excruciating pain I'm talking about so they load me up in the back of the pickup and they're taking me to the hospital I want to tell you brothers and sisters the lights never left me God will never leave us or forsake us. In our worst and most difficult moment, I want to I tell you, I knew I was in trouble. I knew anything could happen. But I knew God was with me. I never felt fair for one second. I was never afraid. Because my whole life, I put all my trust in Jesus. And at this time, I was not going to break down. But I'm going to stand firm and say, Lord Jesus, everything is in your hands. I never felt afraid. Now, I'm not telling you this because I'm just super Christian. I'm telling you this because the grace of God was with me. So we're going on the way to the hospital. The lights are around me. The lights never leave me. They just comforted me. I'm ju I just know that God is with me. They're not seeing the light. I am seeing the light. And the lights are just there. Life-giving, beautiful lights. I close my eyes and I'm still seeing those lights inside my eyes on that day. We reach to the hospital. And they, on the pickup. And the lights never left me behind the, um, behind the pickup in the middle of the day. Hot sunshine. And the guy who is the, the, the contractor who is, not, who is not Catholic, he was just holding me and praying. Holding me and praying. God always sends people when you least expect it to look after all your needs because my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory even when things looking real bad. As a matter of fact, 
after the whole incident, he calls me. Well, we are, we are the best of friends now. He told me, he says, I've been a Christian for many decades. He said, but I have never seen a miracle in my life. He said, I saw a miracle today. <laughs> he had problems. His brother died of COVID and it, it, it prevented him from sleeping. He couldn't sleep after to take medication to sleep. And he began losing his trust and faith in God. But he says after that incident, he can sleep because of the encounter with God that he had. He is now able to sleep without medication. And he says now he's waking up with a song in his heart. He's waking up with the word of God in his heart. So in the midst of all that's happening, brothers and sisters, God is touching people in ways that we least expect it. So we end up in the hospital. And they did an x-ray. And the x-ray showed that there was internal bleeding and multiple broken ribs. So immediately they started working on me in the emergency um, section. All of a sudden, a man appears with the biggest pair of scissors I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> Huge. And he just started cutting my clothes off. He cut off my T-shirt. It was, it, it, was, it, 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 was, it was wrecked anyway. Then he began cutting off my Favorite jockey. <laughs> yeah. You, I don't know about you, but for me, if I have a favorite piece of clothes, I'll wait until it perishes. Yeah. So I had, I had my favorite on the big scissors. Psh, 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 cut it off without my permission. Then he went for my pants. Cut it off. And there I was, naked, because his burden sisters... For, for, them to, for, for, the, for the doctors to work on me, they needed me to be like that. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, some of us who resist God kicking and, cr and screaming, when God starts to strip us, we start to complain. But sometimes God can't work on us until he strips us right down to zero. Take off all the baggage. All the junk, all the old clothes, all the things that are going to hinder him from getting to us. He needs to cut it off. That's why Jesus says, when your right hand offend you, cut it off. He says, your right eye offend you, pluck it out. Because it's better to go to heaven with one eye than go to hell with two, with dark shades. Praise God. Praise God. We got a God in the house. So then I started feeling injections on my side, which didn't feel so bad because the pain here was worse. So they injected me and then they started inserting tubes, a tube to remove blood from the cavity around my lungs. They did it on both sides. But when they put a catheter in me, I just felt this hand, without my permission, of course. <laughs> and ever so gently, this, this nurse is putting this catheter. Now, the, the honestly, brothers, it didn't feel so bad. Because there was pain all over my body. That was like secondary. But when they started putting the catheter on me, I said, Lord... Lord, I close my eyes and say, Lord, everything is in your hands. And when I close my eyes, I saw a book. A brown book. A big book. Like a family album. And that book opened up. Ever so slowly. And I started seeing the portrait of saints. Right there. In the accident and emergency section of the Arima Hospital. So, and the saints were appearing in twos. Saints are not lone rangers. 
They work just as Jesus told his disciples to go in pairs. It seemed as though they're coming in pairs too. But I want to tell you, they were portraits of the saints. They were not pictures of the saints. But whoever did those portraits, it was so exquisitely and beautifully and immaculately done that these saints were looking like they are alive. Their eyes were sparkling. Their skin was, was rich. And they were just looking at me as if to say, we are here with you. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, when we say the creed and we say we believe in the communion of saints, that is real. Amen. It's real. We've got help that we don't know about. We've got friends in high places. And when we need help, God sends his friends to help us. And when we pray, all the time, may the divine assistant remain always with us. We think it's just words that we say from the old Catholic prayer book. I want to tell you, that is for real. Divine assistance is available to God's people on this journey because we belong to the mystical body of Christ. And we are united to them through baptism. That is what we are united to them with. They have been baptized into Christ and so are we. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. So the scene started, the pages, I want to tell you, one, once the book opened, all my pain stopped. And the scenes began coming, and the book, the covers were turning ever so slowly, and ever so gently, and ever so gracefully. It was as though God was slowing down everything, and telling me, cool yourself. You had to go through this. I, brothers and sisters, pain, pain has value. Right? Pain has value. And God allowed me to experience the most excruciating volume of pain that I've ever experienced in my life because he knew that I've been talking a lot about the gospel. But a big part of the gospel is pain. It's not just physical pain, it's emotional pain. As people who are in pastoral work, we feel for people. We feel people's pain, people's loss. When people are in darkness and we see them, we feel that the, the pain that God is experiencing as a result of all of this. Pain helps us to push aside all the things that are not important. Pain helps us to zero in on the things that are critical in our lives. Tell somebody, thank God for pain. And tell them, don't run from the pain. But brothers and sisters, the last page of the album is where all the goodies, the greatest blessing from those saints came. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, sometimes God leaves the best for last. But you see, some of us are so impatient, we can't wait for last. We want it. The last saint appeared by himself. It was as though like he was a, a supervisor or a manager or a commander. I don't know. So he looked at me with so much peace, with so much assurance, with so much love. I felt as though he was drawing me. His eyes were so compassionate. So I thought to myself, in my spirit, I felt that was St. Anthony of Padua. But I wasn't sure. But at that point, I hear a voice say, okay, we're ready to send him to Mount Hope now. And as he said those words, the book disappeared and the pain came back. So anyway, while I was there in hospital, my dear wife came. I can't remember very, I don't remember much, but she came. That voice that she has is such a healing, sweet, lovely voice. Yeah, it's like a bomb. So I thank God, my, my children came, 
They didn't recognize me. They never saw me that dark. Uh, people in the prayer group came and they said, where is Brother Winston? The doctor said there. They said, no, that, that, is, that is not him. But thank God, Jesus recognizes us. And he knows that we are his. We are his. And he knows how to keep us. So when the lights left was when they were able to give me oxygen and they were able to stabilize me. Then the lights slowly withdrew and then I had to deal with the book. Okay, so we're down in, we're down in Mount Hope now. Tests, I had to run a test to see what's going on with me and so on. The test revealed that I had suffered internal injury. 18 of my ribs were broken. Or the 24. At least. When I saw... Well, I would like to take, take off your lights again and all that drama... Okay, all right. When I saw pictures of where the truck was and where my body was, brothers and sisters, it's a miracle that anybody could survive that. But with God, all things are possible. So 18 broken and fractured ribs. My lungs were damaged. They were Bleeding on the, it was bleeding on the inside. I had a 10 centimeter laceration on my liver, which was also bleeding. I had two hairline fractures on two of my vertebrae. My hemoglobin count was going out of control. It had reached 8.1. And the doctor said if it reached 8, I run the risk of having multiple organ failure. So they called Debbie to tell her that. That was on the second day. And of course, she called for, for prayer support in the community. The committee had set up a 24-hour prayer chain that was going around the clock. And everybody would take an hour and so on. And they started praying. And what was going, 8.1 going down, in the name of Jesus, 8.1 started moving in the right direction. So my hemoglobin count started to look very good. I found myself not being able to speak properly, not knowing that there was a hematoma underneath my tongue. Blood vessels had ruptured underneath my tongue, and there was a big lump there that was hindering um, impeding the way I communicated, I could hardly talk. But while I'm in hospital dealing with all of this, I have to cut short the story because I know we are against, time is against us and so on. While I'm there, I can't get St. Anthony or who I think was St. Anthony out of my mind. So one day, my brother Kevin and Debbie they came to look for me. And it was important for Kevin to come to see me because he was haunted by the sight of me underneath the vehicle with my eyes half open, staring, at, staring in one direction and not breathing for so long. So he had to come every day to make sure I was really alive. It was important for him. So I said... Debbie, please Google St. Anthony for me, please. Put a, I want to see what he looks like. And Debbie told Kevin, Kevin, because she was cleaning me up and so on. At four days, I couldn't eat or drink anything. I was on drips because they didn't know if I had to do emergency surgery. My tongue, uh, the evidence that I knew my tongue was on the road is after I start back eating, I start, back, I start discovering gravel inside my mouth. Four days afterward. So she told Kevin, Google St. Anthony. When, he, when she did, and I saw 
a picture of St. Anthony of Padua, I broke down and started to cry. Because it was him, it was St. Anthony, God sent his best friend to look after me in my darkest moment, to comfort me, to let me know I was going to be all right. St. Anthony is, uh, is, is one of the holiest, most humble saints with whom a lot of miracles are associated. So ever since then, I've been, I've been learning about St. Anthony. I've been praying and asking God to help me find how I should live the rest of my life, how I should, how I should express my Christianity in the world, how should I lead people in a deeper relationship with him. And he introduced me to St. Anthony of Padua at a time when I never expected that. So I have been crying, and uh, it, was, it was affecting Debbie because I cry, um, I cry every day. Home or in hospital. If the breeze blow too hard, I cry. Because of the mercy of God, because of the love of God, because of how he reached down and he cared about me personally. I can't stop crying. And it's not a kind of cry where you say, I'm crying because I'm sad. I'm crying because I'm free. Because of another opportunity to serve God. To grow in holiness. Amen. Amen. So what I learned about St. Anthony, it has given me a second wind in life. St. Anthony appears in Catholic iconography. He appears with lilies. You ever saw him with lilies? Yeah. Lilies are a symbol of purity. I always wanted to cultivate a pure heart. The, 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 the beatitude which appeals to me more than anyone is blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God. The lilies are a symbol of purity, of chastity, of sincerity. It also brings a fragrance to a space. And my prayer has always been, as Auntie Babsy keeps saying, that we should exude the aroma of Christ. I never forgot that. So that lily means a whole lot to me. And thank God when I came home after 10 days, only 10 days I spent in the hospital. My, my dear wife had a big bouquet of lilies waiting in my bedroom for me. And the whole room had a fragrance. The aroma of lilies. And my dream is that my life will, will have the aroma of Christ. And when Jesus sees me, he doesn't have to see me like... He doesn't have to, 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 to close his nostrils to when he's around me because of the aroma of my sin. But he smells the aroma of the anointing of God upon me and the love of God upon me. Amen! Amen. He also appears with the child Jesus. St. Anthony believed... In the incarnation, in God becoming man, and he, he gloried in the humanity of Jesus. And he had a, he had a visitation from the child Jesus one, 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 at one time in his life that transformed his whole life. And so that is what I want for myself. So in, I was in hospital, in pain, but God was teaching me. I want to tell you, in the midst of all your pain and brokenness, Look for opportunities where God will be teaching you and showing you. If you're a disciple, God is going to train you. He's going to form you. He's going to prepare you. And when other people see in needles and injections and drips and oxygen, you are seeing the glory of God. You are seeing a way out. Do I hear amen? Amen! Amen! So the child Jesus is a symbol of, symbol of innocence. That is all I am praying for. I don't want when I pray before the throne of God that guilt is written all over my face. I want innocence. The innocence of a child to be all over me. That's my dream. St. Anthony, in one short vision, he 
So he filled all the blanks in my life. Do I hear amen? Yeah. St. Anthony is also in Catholic iconography. He's also pictured with a book. He loved the word of God. And he loved preaching the word of God. He was a preacher. And that is what I want to do with, with, with all I have always done since I got baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1977. I always wanted to be a preacher. Some people saw in me a guitarist. Some people saw in me a singer. But I saw in myself a preacher. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. St. Anthony also is pictured with, with bread. He has a love for the poor. And Pope Francis has told renewal leaders to do three things. Number one, conduct life in the spirit seminars in every parish in the church. Number two, build bridges of ecumenism to reach out to other religions. In that car, this guy was an evangelical. He's asking me now, where do you all fellowship? Jesus can get him. He's already to three quarter percent there. Is it three quarter percent? Seventy five percent there. Last week he called me. He said, "Brother, you know, every time I talk to you, I feel so good. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. But sometimes you, we talk so short. I wish we could talk some more." He's feeling the anointing. He's feeling the glory of God. He's feeling that he's in the presence of a serious Christian, somebody who is connected to Jesus. To all the things, all the bad things he's been hearing about our church, they're getting canceled off one at a time. That is what we're supposed to be representatives for our church. And when people meet us, they, they will say, Oh my God, I heard so many bad things about you all, but you guys are amazing. You Catholics are amazing. Hallelujah. Amen. So, in conclusion, I would like to say, God is real. Our God is real. And he is, a, he is he is the God of millimeters. He is the God of micro, micrometers? Nanoseconds. Nanometers too? Our God is aware and conscious of every single little thing that's happening in your life. You better believe it. Let me tell you. My tongue was on the road. But God spared me from all my teeth getting lost. <laughs> Praise God. I didn't lose one tooth. Not a chip. According to my dear wife. My spectacles. I was so close to getting crushed. My spectacles are still, there are still scratches on my spectacles. How close are my eyes from my spectacles? Millimeters. But God sees me. God is aware. God wants me to see still. I have work to do. Do I hear amen? amen. My neck. After I came out of hospital, I, I, I used to experience, like, my, mom, my mom used to call it gristle. But it's cartilage, right? Like, it's though the outer place. And if I, if I turn my neck at a particular angle, I hear grooks, grooks, grooks in my neck. A little more strain on my neck, and I could have been paralyzed. But God said, no, not today. Because he's in control of millimeters. He's in control of all these things in our life. My shoulders were compressed. When I saw, when you'll see, you'll, they'll, show, they'll show you the pictures afterwards, yeah. My shoulders were compressed. I still, I couldn't, when I came out of hospital, I couldn't lift up my hand to put on the toilet light. There were some things I couldn't even do for myself. Because I was under so much pain, my muscles were stretched out. And, 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 and 
damaged. But thanks be to God, I'm on the road to recovery. I'm on the road to full recovery in the name of Jesus. There were two hairline fractures on my spine. Brothers and sisters, you know what, hap what could happen if that was worse than that. Paralysis. Of, I can run. People, when they come to look for me, they say, you're walking? I said, of course I'm walking. When my neighbors heard what was going on, one day somebody came to bring coconut water for me, and I went to collect it. Was day, I went to collect it for myself to say thanks. The neighbor says, Winston? I said, yes. He said, that's you? I say, yeah. He said, from, from what I hear, I I'm not expecting that. I'm expecting a feeble man who could hardly speak and so on. I tell him, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I spent 10 days in the hospital. Only. A friend, a friend of mine told her niece who's a doctor down there, go and look for Winston Garcia every single day. As long as you go to work, make sure and look for Winston Garcia. She gets my file, and she went to look for me in the ICU. But thank God, I wasn't in the ICU. Because Jesus said, Winston, I see you. So she called, she called to say, listen, I don't think, she said, because people with that kind of injury could only be in two places, either in the ICU or in the, in the morgue. But thanks be to God, I was neither in the ICU or in the morgue. I was on surgical two, recuperating in the name of Jesus. There was a Muslim guy on my ward. The day I was leaving, he said, he was supposed to go for surgery and he decided to change his mind. He says he could die under the surgery. I said, brother, you can't do that now. He said, you got to trust in God. He said, in, I said, in our faith, our God is like a shepherd. He holds sheep in his hands and he loves them and he brings them through the most difficult moments. I said, can you see your God being a shepherd for you today, holding you in his arms? Okay, I'm going to bed. <laughs> so he changed his mind and he went to do his surgery. But he says, before I go, I want to tell you something. He said, there was an angel by your bed last night. I didn't see it. But somebody else saw it. There was an angel. But I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. David says, all of us have two angels walking with us. Because the psalm says, surely, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Amen. Yes. So, brothers and sisters, this encounter has brought me closer to my family. My children kissing me now more than ever. I have five children. Three boys and two girls. And they, they, they appreciate me more than ever. I appreciate them more than ever. And uh, we pray more. We do more things together. We appreciate each, each other more. Don't wait until something happens to you for that to happen. Go back home and start loving and reaching out and touching and praying and anointing. I'm getting foot rubbing thing now. I'm getting all kind of thing now. L lose the love of God in the home. Amen? But before I go, amen, before I go, I just want to say something about the theme. Because I was asked to prepare something, but just a few. The theme says, can you read? No, you're, you're blocking you. It says, you were, you were, you were darkness. This text didn't say you were in darkness, you know. This text says, you were darkness. In other words, you were darkness personified before Jesus. But now, but now you are 
not just in the light, but you are light itself. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Uh, we're not supposed to be running from the darkness. The darkness has to be running from us. We're not supposed to be running from the devil. The devil has to be running from us because we have the light of Christ in us. Do I hear amen? Do I hear amen? You were in darkness once. You were, sorry, you were darkness once. It means you had a history. But Jesus came in and changed your history. But now you're no longer darkness. You are the light of the world. Your little light so bright that it can light up the whole world. We underestimate the power and the anointing that is upon us. We see ourselves as just sinners. I want to tell you something. That is not your greatest identity. Do not get comfortable with the fact that we are all sinners. You are saint of God. Jesus did not waste his blood on Calvary. He washed us. He saw you in your mess. He bent down. He picked you up. He wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life. He looked you in your eyes and he called you child, called you son. And if you're a son, you are an heir to the kingdom of God. Lift up your hands and shout amen with somebody. So I want you to go shine the light in your life and every darkness dispel it. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, what fellowship has light with darkness. The sooner the light come in, it is sooner the darkness leaves. And some people get so comfortable with the darkness, they could explain it. They could rationalize it. And they get vexed with people who tell them about it. That's why so many people vex with Father Taylor. Father Taylor tell you as it is, not as it was. Or as it will be. He tells you as it is. And that's what we need all of us to be. To, to be. And then there will be a massive explosion in Trinidad. An explosion of praise. An explosion of worship. An explosion of righteousness. An explosion of glory. An explosion of people being brave. When you go to the hospital. Where were Father, Father Taylor going to the hospital. What is he doing in the hospital? Huh? What is he doing? Yes. Well, what are we doing to go to the hospital? We have a, a donation sheet. Yes. Curry Q. Barbecue. We lost our way. As one brother says, what, 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 what are you doing? Uh, would you help build a curry queue for my church? He says, get off the street. You want embarrassment to your father. Start praising God. Start blessing God. Amen? Amen? So you were darkness once. I want you to... But they did an MRI on me. Pushed me into this tunnel. And this thing was able to, to, to say everything that was broken and, and, and damaged inside of me. Brothers and sisters, it breaks my heart to see people who come into the MRI of the mass. And go back home and grumpy as usual, quarreling as usual, lying as usual, undermining people as usual. But it just came from the table of the Lord. Let the MRI of the mass and the word of God begin to clean you up. Clean every single area of your life. Amen. Amen. Now it says, live as children of the light. That's how we have to live. We have to be, that's why there's an examination we're supposed to do twice a day. An examination of, not conscience, you know, consciousness. Because too many people are unconscious. It's frustrating God. It's frustrating renewal. We are poor witnesses. We are frustrated and blocking the Holy Spirit because our consciousness has been dulled. We we explaining away sin and we expl expect the glory of God to come down. God does not bless mess. That's why he shed his blood. 
to cleanse us, to free us, to deliver us, and now to release us into the world to, to bring souls to Jesus Christ. See? So I thank God for, we thank God for this opportunity. I want you to know that the faith we belong to is rooted in God. It's rooted in the apostles. You're in the right church. Don't let anybody tell you you're in the wrong church and we're not a Bible church and we're not full gospel church. The fullest gospel church is the Catholic church. Take it or leave it. Amen. So I just want to say a prayer with you before I go. Okay, okay, sure. Oh, yes. Okay, good. So this is the vehicle upside down there. That's a high lock. No. It's only because it's on its side. But those tires are size 15, 33, really broad. This, is, this, is, this, this vehicle was a, is a sport vehicle. It's a real high vehicle. Yes, Father. You'll have problems getting into that. All right, next one, next one, please. Right. Okay, this is the another angle of the same vehicle. Let's another, another pick again. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right, right, right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. You see, you see where he is there? He's trying to, to turn the engine. We thought the engine went off. The engine kept running through the whole thing, even while it's on, 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 on the side like that. You, you see the space between the top of this vehicle and the road? I was, I was underneath there, half of my body outside, and this on top of my back. Right? Okay. But when I saw this last, I only saw this last week. I was under there. Right there, so by the driver's, right the driver's door right there. I was under there with my head and my... Half, half and half. Half in and half out. Like a lot of lukewarm Christians. Ex excuse my analogies, I'm a preacher. I look for opportunities to preach the word every time. Go again, please. Right, the ambulance reached late. Right. Go again. Right, this is the nephew here. He's trying to go again. Okay, that, that is me there. If you notice, let me tell you something, I couldn't even, there was so much pain, I couldn't even pray properly. Well, well that, that's before that. <laughs> but if you notice in my hand, you see some beads there? Let me tell you something, when you can't pray, hold on to your rosary. When you hold on to the rosary, you're holding on to the glorious mysteries. You're holding on to the sorrowful mysteries. You hold what is the other mystery again? You hold on to the joyful mystery. You're holding on to the luminous mystery. So that is your faith. Hold on and never, never give up. I needed oxygen. Got to check my heart, my liver, my oxygen levels, everything. At this point, I was conscious. Yes. You see how, you see, you see how uh, uh, I'm still a little discolored after a couple of days? Yeah. Yeah. I get, I get a tan in the shade. This is me. The first day I was in hospital. This is me here. This access here will never give me morphine. I, yes, I'm conscious all here. But it, there's just so much pain. It's just so much pain that the, the best comfort is sleep. And sleep. All right. Yes, go ahead. Well, Debbie Reach, you see. 
but I'm not letting go of, yes, yes. I just knew I was going to be all right. Yes. That's my daughter there. Yes, Jean Marie. And thank God she happens to be a physiotherapist, so she gives me all the exercises to do to get back the few muscles that are hard. If you notice how my stomach was pink there, that's where all the skin was burnt off on the road. Yes. And I was swollen. I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a big guy, but uh, in my face was swollen, my body was swollen. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how difficult your situation looks. Trust in God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, Lord. All right, go ahead. That's it? Yes. So, thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony. Right. I have no shame about showing, my, my, my exposing myself like that because it, it shows how good God is and how God could get you in the worst of situation and bring you out. He's a way maker. He's a promise keeper. Hallelujah. Amen. So, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are gathered here. Uh -huh. Praise God. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. God was speaking to me in many ways that day. I was actually at work in Port of Spain, and they had been ringing down my phone. I was in an all-day meeting, a special exercise. My phone was on silent, so I never saw it. But Kevin's wife works with me in the same place, and she messaged me on our internal messaging system. Debbie, call Kevin, do not panic. Well, I panicked immediately because I know that Winston and Kevin spend a lot of time together and they are always going up the hill in his vehicle. And I felt something serious had happened because she said, don't panic. That's normally, and you know, when you say, don't, don't worry about that. You, that's probably when things really serious, right? But thanks be to God, as the voice of God had been speaking to Winston as he was going up that hill, that morning in the meeting, a girl shows up in a sweater with the words, God's got this. And I observed and I said, thanks be to God, we live in Trinidad where you could come to work with a positive Jesus message on your t-shirt. Because, you know, if we were in other parts of the world, you couldn't come through the doors of anywhere or go in public with a Jesus message. And when I got that, when I got the, the, the message on the internal messaging system, I turned to the girl next to me. I see a friend who knows her. I turned to Annaline. She was next to me, Moses. And I said, um, something very serious clearly has happened. And it involves my husband. I'm going to make a call, and I don't know what I'm going to encounter. And she came outside with me while I placed that call, and the girl with the, um, but I called Winston, I, well, I called Kevin, I called I call Winston, I called Winston, call Kevin, I am calling Kevin, I called in Winston, I called Winston. And um, I thought it was Kevin who answered the phone, but it was Winston's nephew, Kerry. And he said, Uncle Winston has been in a serious accident. I said, can he talk? Yes. I said, put him on the phone to me now. You see how Winston was given instructions? Put me at 90, put me at 45, put me. We give instructions a lot. We are very, 
So I was given instructions. I said, put him on the phone now. And he gave me the phone. And he said, Debbie, I've been in an accident. And he sounded like this. But I'm going to be all right. And I thought, oh, my God. But this is how God speaks to us. Through that T-shirt, that message, I'm telling myself God's got this. And, and um, 30 years ago, in, within four months of our marriage, Winston fell 25 feet from a mango tree in our yard. La picking mangoes for me. Felt I needed to have a starch mango at that point in time. I saw him climb the tree, and I saw him come tumbling down as the branches broke. And he landed on two bags of manure that saved his life. So a catalyst have about nine lives. I don't know how many he had. <laughs> but thanks be to God. And I remember walking down the stairs, um, going to attend to him uh, as he landed on those bags of manure. And I heard my marriage vow, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. And I committed to that. This is four months into our marriage. I committed to my covenant pledge and vow to God and to Winston and to all the witnesses who were there that day at our wedding. And when I went to him, I said, how are you? And he said, I'm going to be all right. So it was like God, how he took Peter back to the charcoal fire to have those words repeated to him, to have people Peter affirm his, his trust and, and love for God and commitment to God. God took me back to those same words that when Winston, when you said that, I remembered 30 years ago and what that meant. And in a sense, there was assurance in my heart. The girls who, Annalene came outside with me, the girl wearing her t-shirt came out with me and they knew the message I had got was a serious one. And I said, my husband has been in a serious accident. I have to leave now. Are you okay to drive? You need a taxi? I'm like, I'm okay. God's got this. I went, I packed up my things, and I, I, I don't think I had time to be afraid. I didn't have, I, I, I didn't cry, not because I didn't feel it, but I was going on the faith and the grace of God because people had, a, had been praying, the church had been offering masses, and I was prepared for whatever was to come. My life is in the hands of the Lord, and so is his. And I got there, and I asked the doctor when I first saw him, what would you do if this were, what would, where, where do you recommend we take him? He said, well, you know, private, expensive, and so on. I said, we have insurance. Um, the company will cover that. Don't worry. Where's the best place for him to be? And he said, let me talk to my supervisor. He went to me. He got advice, and he came back, and he said, I cannot advise you. And I thought maybe he didn't want to accept liability. You know, if you say take him private and something happen, I sue them. If you say take him mount up and something happen, I still sue them. So he was, on, um, he was taking the safe way out. So I asked another question. I said, if that was your spouse in the room there, where would you take your spouse? And he stopped and he paused. And I'm just praying. I'm just, not, not that I'm praying out loud, you know. I'm just praying in my heart. I couldn't pray in tongues, probably for the first time in my life. But all I could say was Jesus. I said, Jesus from Port of Spain to Arima. And as I spoke to people and as I related the story, I was just saying, Jesus in my spirit, Jesus in my spirit. So I'm saying, Jesus, you better speak to this doctor to tell me what to do. And he said, I would take my, my spouse to Mount Hope. And that's what we did. And God took care of every single thing. I believe that there is no situation that is too, that is impossible for God to turn around. What the devil meant for evil, for destruction, for breaking Winston, myself, the family, the community, maybe the church. God turned that around and he's using it for his glory and his honor. Amen. Let me just say this. 
is the fourth time I escaped there. I was supposed to I was supposed to be aborted as a baby. My mother wanted to, to, to abort me. Um, I also had, had uh, typhoid fever, and then um, I fell 25 feet from the tree, and a man came selling manure the day before, and I fell on the bag the day after, and this last episode here. So I thank God for the four times that I could have gone, and the la all, whatever time I have left is 100% for Jesus.